All right, we're recording. We're kicking up the live stream. Posting on Twitter. All y'all on Twitter, I love you guys. Hello, world. Yeah. So this is going to be a pretty casual stream in contrast to some previous streams. And the reason for that is, wow, we had some interesting technical moments with last week's stream, and those have all been sorted out, I'm pleased to say. But regardless, I just wanted to make this this Thursday's stream today, like, super casual, because I'm feeling kind of tense. Um, some of y'all might be feeling tense. It's kind of that time in the world. So, yeah, I thought I would just mellow it out and use the simple tools in front of me, this laptop specifically, and um, not aspire to the greatness I've seen some people step up to in the live streaming world with multiple cameras and mics and all this crazy stuff. Actually, I think the people that are doing it best are just keeping it real and keeping it simple. So that's what I'm hoping to do for you guys today. So, yeah, I did pick a theme, and I'll be talking about all that stuff. Um, the theme today is making and hacking tools of creation and specifically I thought it'd be cool to talk about what I do as a maker and a hacker because um, most people know me as a musical anti-hero and I have these cool you know custom guitar things and controller things you know but how the heck do you actually create that stuff you know you might not be ready to jump deep into some electrical engineering but you might be really curious to know what kind of tools person like me could self-educate themselves on, a person like you, of course, um, in order to make stuff like that. So yeah, thought it'd make for an interesting live stream. So that's what we're doing. Um, if you want to jump in the chat and ask any questions about any of this stuff, or if you want to totally derail the conversation by talking about, oh, I don't know, you know, the weather, the news, um, any of that stuff, I'm willing to go there. So just let me know. Um, this is also an experiment in that I didn't create an event or promote this stream up until about five minutes ago. <laughs> so this will be a good experiment to see um, how viewership is affected by that kind of stuff that I've just been doing by default. Things they want you to do, the social media networks want you to do. I'm resisting at least a little bit today. So um, without further ado, I'm just going to jump in um, and start talking about this stuff. Stick to an overview for now. Um, so that um, we can get in a little deeper a little bit later and actually I'll just review some of the tools that I won't be getting too deep into. Um, so yeah, um, when I talk about making and hacking, talking about some of the stuff I make, I'm going to share my desktop with you, throw up something more interesting than this Facebook page and other social media pages. Let's get to um, jamboxes.net. This is just a tie to what we did last week, which is we talked with Rich DDT about making these crazy things I call jam boxes. Um, here's a good example. The 8-bit boombox, a hacked up boombox. Uh, this is a video of the Octomasher, this crazy eight-sided musical instrument. Um, there's, of course, other people's, other people's instruments here. This is the Octomasher right here. Um, so this is just kind of one vein of hardware that I make. Um, I have a Wikipedia page now. How do I find me on Wikipedia? Um, there I am. Sure enough. Uh, and this is cool because, yeah, it shows like hacking stuff, like this controller over on the right. It shows making stuff. It's my first custom MIDI controller, the Mojo. There's the Robo Guitar, the uh, Robo Caster, the custom guitar I was just referencing, Guitar Wing, Octomasher. Mm, so yeah, um, how do I how do I make stuff? And specifically, how do I make stuff? Uh, let's say these days, Let me get over to OBS. Make sure you can see me. And blow my face up a little bit bigger. Yeah, just live in the corner there. Um, yeah, how the heck do I make these things? I'm gonna keep an eye on our our chat here. And um, the answer is there's a whole lot of software <laughs> involved. Um, one of the things I'm not going to get super deep into is uh, Ableton Live because, man, there's just so many other people in so many other places and, and even where I myself get in Ableton Live. And I like to mention Ableton because it's such a cool, versatile toolkit for doing all things audio. And specifically, like, if you want to make something fast and you want to still make it sound good, it's a wonderful tool. Um, you can 
do a million things with it. I'm really not going to get into it, but to me it's like a Swiss Army knife or, you know, Leatherman is kind of a modern version of that. Basically like the multi-tool. Um, it's not like uh, a jackhammer. It's not going to do destroying concrete really well. Similarly, like it's not as good as something like Pro Tools for recording with like 30 mics, live orchestra recording or something like that. Um, it's not as good as something super dedicated to like say like really deep editing like there's another tool I frequently use, frequently use for audio editing um, called RX uh, from Isotope and this is specifically for editing just two track audio um, but you can do really cool stuff with it because um, it's got all these like special views and you can kind of like treat your audio like Photoshop and uh, paint out certain parts of it. It's great for um, removing noise and clipping and all those kind of things. So we're not talking about that. And we're not going to get into Ableton. But Ableton is super great for just doing all things quickly. Like I want to play some sounds. I want to trigger some sounds from some controllers. I want synthesizers. I want samplers. I want effects. Um, I want to like, you know, route one thing into another. Control it with this thing. And have all these sounds change when I do this thing. It's just like a really, really cool environment. Uh, not only for music creation and for music performance, which is what it was designed for, but also for all kinds of interactive music uh, kind of design stuff. So, uh, yeah, so we're not really going to talk deeply about Ableton, but maybe we'll segue into Max. So Max has been around for a long time. Um, Max is the cousin of uh, a free program called PD, or Pure Data, so that's a good one to check out. Um, if you don't want to spend the cash to get something like Max, but Max is what they call an object-oriented programming language. So it's sort of like one step above something like uh, C++ or, I don't know, other coding languages I don't know as well, like actually higher level, but like Python and Java and JavaScript, for example. Um, and it's higher than those in that, like, you're not actually writing lines of code, which we could look at a little bit later in something like the Arduino IDE, but you are um, instead connecting together little boxes and lines. So you can see there's <clears throat> a whole bunch of boxes in front of me and a whole bunch of lines, and it looks a little bit um, like spaghetti. Um, and it can be really confusing and daunting when you first look at it, but we'll just, we'll just make a new document real quick, and I'll give you, like, kind of the basics of it. You can make all kinds of things. Um, you can make interface elements, like we could have um, sliders, for example. Um, so let's grab, in fact, a slider. This is a, a generic slider, and you can make it bigger and smaller and move it up and down, and that's all the sliders do. Um, but what would we want to do with the slider? Well, maybe we want to look at its value. So we'll create um, just a number box. So let's create an integer number box. And we'll connect the output, outputs are on the bottom in max, to the input of this number box um, with a little wire. And I love those little cable animations. You click and drag and boing, beautiful. Um, and now we can see the numbers that the slider is outputting. And it's funny, it goes from zero to 127. I wonder why it does that. It does that because those are important values in the world of MIDI. That's a, uh, is that a seven bit? I think it's a 7-bit number. I think 8 bits is uh, 256. Um, anyway, um, 128 values is really commonly used in MIDI, and that points to the history of Max, where it started off as this really powerful program um, for manipulating musical data. And MIDI is one of the earliest forms of digital music data that you want to work with. So it's really great for doing that kind of stuff, and I do that with it all the time. Um, but just to give you, like, I don't know, like a super, super simple example. We can copy the slider over here. We can make another super simple object. Other ways you can create objects is like, if you happen to know the name of what you're looking for, you can just say like, I want to make a new object. Let's grab this uh, blank object and start typing what we think it is. I want to make an addition object. I'm going to add the value of these two sliders. I'm going to type plus, and there's this useful little catalog here that kind of helps you find stuff as you're typing. You can type stuff just like in Google, like J, oh, yeah, join. Maybe that's what I want. Or maybe I want to, like, sort things. What if I type sort? Oh, look, there's some objects related to sorting. So um, you can find what you want by, like, poking through that, but uh, it helps to do some tutorials. Anyways, uh, this is really simple. We can add this and this. 
And instead of having this connected here, we'll connect it here. And now let's see what happens. Okay, we still see that number. And funny, we don't see anything when we move this slider, but let's move this one all the way to the top and then move this one. And sure enough, we got much bigger values. And so you can see this patch is kind of working. Patch is sort of what we call this, mm, this environment, uh, uh, the things we make in this environment. Uh, and one of the quirks is just that like objects uh, like this box have specific behaviors and you really need to like understand them or read the built-in help files. They're really easy to access, access help files for everything. Um, but you can hover over things too and see like, oh, like set left operand, trigger the calculation. So calculations only get triggered by the left side. If you look at the right side, oh, right, set right operand. So it doesn't actually trigger the calculation unless something comes in the left side. And you might be like, why did they do that? That's super weird. And there's usually like a really good reason. And it usually comes down to like, things like programming efficiency and you know the fact that it really is just code running in these objects <clears throat> and you're only one step away from that code um, but you need to kind of have a similar kind of savvy and know-how of a programmer um, to use something like Max. Uh, Max goes much much deeper um, it does all this powerful stuff with data and that's Max and there's Max signal processing which was like the second layer that they added where you can have audio objects. So everything to do with audio has a tilde in it, and I really don't do a whole lot of audio stuff. Um, but um, yeah, all the audio stuff do um, like in poly, uh, yeah, info, simple. Yeah, there's so many of these things. Um, but yeah, all the, the patch cables for audio objects. Um, <laughs> improvising here. Uh, our, our dotted lines. Let's just open one of those up. Or heck, we can just look at our example patch. That's much better. So you can see this example over here. Is it zoom when I do that? I want to know. I want to know. So yeah. Um, the dotted line indicates an audio path instead of data paths. And then there's also jitter, which is the video end of Max. So it gets super deep, many layers, lots to learn, um, but it's a super powerful tool. So much more powerful than Ableton. And the cool thing is that it's now owned and operated by the same company that makes Ableton. And so Ableton has all these Max for Live uh, devices. And basically, um, these are all these custom ones that I've designed. Um, it, uh, it runs Max in the background and integrates very deeply into Ableton. So not only can you have these little patches <clears throat> for Max running right inside of Ableton, um, you can pop them open and edit them over in Max. Max kind of becomes an editor for these devices. But these devices can also access Ableton's API, which stands for Application Programming Interface. You don't need to know that, but the point is they can talk to Ableton on this deeper deeper level. So you could have a device like this, where normally this thing only deals with, oh, it's got audio coming in and audio coming out, or MIDI coming in and audio coming out, something simple like that. Um, but these devices, as Max for Live devices, can like control Ableton's tempo, or like talk to other devices like kind of remotely, or um, map from one thing to another. It's like super powerful. Um, and it kind of lets you build things um, for yourself to use in Ableton Live or for other users. And I use it for that a lot. I'll make patches um, or edit, modify patches for clients of mine when I'm making more complex systems or need Ableton Live to do something powerful that I can't do natively. So, um, yeah, so that is Max. Any questions? No, I don't think so. Because, yeah, it turns out no one has found this live stream. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's happen what's what happens when you don't promote it. So let's throw it up um throw it up on my personal Facebook page. How about that? This is a pro tip, total non sequitur. Um I use a plugin for Chrome. I forget what it's called. I think it's called News Eradicator, but it basically just takes away your news feed whenever you go to able uh, whenever you go to um uh Facebook. Live stream. Um Hacking. Um, and I like it because I can go to Facebook and I can make posts like this one 
and I don't see a news feed. Instead, all I see is these wonderful quotes. I get a little repetitive, but um, still cool to see. Um, yeah, Newsfeed Eradicator. There it is right there with a link. So check out Newsfeed Eradicator. <laughs> Hopefully we get some people to chat to. I don't want to be all alone. So it happens sometimes. I'm running all this software at the same time just to see what happens. I think it'll be entertaining. Um, so let me talk about something maybe a little lower level. We talked about the geekiness of Max. Mm, we're going to fly back out. Um, no, let's go deeper. I take that back. Apologies. Um, we're going to go deeper. We're going to go to Arduino because I just started talking about Max and how it's kind of like a level higher than coding. You know, you can just find the boxes you need. You can patch them together. What's the plugin called? Welcome, Marco. Uh, it's called News Feed Eradicator. Eradicator. Yeah, use, use Facebook without being bombarded by the, like, oh, my friend is having a huge problem, or like somebody I forgot about just got married and I feel obligated to interact with it now. Use Newsfeed at Radicator and then you won't have to worry about all that business. So yeah, Ooh, what are two co I have two copies of Max running. How did I do that? I must have two versions. The one's talking to Ableton. Super weird. Well, let's uh, put one of them, shall we? Not put that one, let's put that one. Uh, yeah, so Arduino. People talk about Arduino all the time. What the heck is Arduino? Um, I'm going to show you real quick mm, the Arduino website. No, we'll, uh, we'll just do Arduino into Google. So Arduino is a few things, but basically it is a microcontroller. What's a microcontroller? That's really just a computer. It's a little, tiny, cheap computer, but what's special about it, I mean, there's all kinds of microcontrollers out there in the world. Um, let's look at Arduino on SparkFun. Um, there's all kinds of these things out there, but what's special about Arduino is it's been around for a long time, and the whole philosophy of this company, they're based in Italy, was to make hardware computing really accessible and fun um, for all kinds of people. So, you know, microcontrollers are everywhere. They're all around you. Um, but typically, you know, they're in things like uh, your microwave or, I don't know, your uh, your uh, your action camera or, you know, I don't know what. But, um, yeah, anything digital, which is so many things in the world today, has a microcontroller in it. Um, but they're pretty hard to work with until Arduino came along. So, essentially, at its core, Arduino is this hardware thingy you see in front of me. It's got a USB jack, so you can hook it up to your computer. You can load code into it uh, using Arduino's free um, IDE. Um, IDE is a uh, development environment, something in development environment. I'm still getting hip to the, uh, the terminology in the coding world. I'm actually going through a C++ tutorial, and it's very humbling. Watch out for that. Um, but uh, but yeah, so it you know it comes with this kind of easy environment where you can edit uh, C++, which is the code that runs on this microcontroller. And as you can see, C++ is a lot more intimidating, in my opinion, than something like Max. Um, I'd rather draw boxes and lines, even if I have to hunt and read help files and tutorials to find the right box and figure out how that box works. It's a lot easier than trying to figure out how C++ works. Um, which I recommend, recommend too, but um, this is the kind of thing you definitely need to take a class in or do a bunch of online tutorials to really understand, um, like I'm working on. You can you can copy and paste code. It, you know, it comes with all these examples. Um, I use, uh, well, yeah, here's an example. Uh, basics, blink. You know, this is the code that will make the built-in LED on your Arduino blink. Um, and it's pretty simple. There's a whole bunch of gray text that you don't even need to read, but basically it's setting up one of the hardware connections, one of the pins we call them, just one of the outputs on this thing, uh, to turn an LED on and wait, and then turn the LED off, and then wait, and just keep turning it on and off. So this this code like blinks an LED. So you can mess with this and you can change, you know, the delay time here. That's you know, you can figure out, oh, that's how long it waits before it turns the LED off after turning it on. And that's what I've been doing is cutting cutting and pasting and remembering what I can from this 
high school class I took on C++ ages ago. Um, but yeah, so, uh, but Arduino comes in all these flavors, and that's the cool thing, is it's like an open, I believe it's an open source hardware thing. Um, I could be wrong on that. Please correct me if I am. But uh, point being, it's like, it's not only the Arduino company that makes Arduinos, it's all kinds of different companies. So they make them big and small and fast and powerful and expensive and super small and super cheap. And yeah, all types of flavors. And um, there's one that I really love because the person who has worked hard to develop uh, this one called Teensy. Let's go back to uh, here we go. Go to their website. The person who's developed Teensy um, has also added these kind of layers to Teensy, things that make it easier uh, to do the kind of things I do, which are like audio things. Like so, this is the Teensy. Is the, he's made really powerful and fast, also inexpensive and also very small. So that makes them really useful for a lot of things. Um, um, Paul is the guy guy's name. Um, he has yeah, his company with his wife, and they've done a great job. And um, so they've not only made like Arduinos really small and cheap and powerful, um, which is really hard to do, but also high quality. So it's like they've kind of like done this unicorn thing. Um, so these are the microcontrollers I've been using for the longest time. And these have a little partner application that runs alongside Arduino. So um, you don't see it right now, but if I were to hook up a Teensy to my USB port or something, or if I just run this application, it's just got this little helper application, and this is the application that just talks to this specific flavor of Arduino, I like to call it. Um, Teensy is a flavor of Arduino, and so it has this little helper dealy that helps it communicate with the Teensy. But the cool thing is, is um, it makes it really easy to, like, for example, make a native MIDI controller. Like, if I just hook up a regular Arduino to my computer, my computer sees it as a serial device. And most applications on my computer, they don't know what to do with a serial device. That's a super generic kind of connection method, super generic protocol uh, to talk between peripherals and uh, computers like my laptop. Um, so they're not going to do much. And I can run this Arduino IDE, and then I can you know, program the thing and do a lot with it. Um, but I'm in this world where like, I want to make things like MIDI controllers you can use with all kinds of applications, like Macs, like uh, Ableton Live, and um, and then things that I could like, you know, give or sell to other music makers, and they could just hook up to their computer and it starts sending MIDI, and it works as a MIDI device. And that's one of the things that uh, that Paul has done. So, like, when your board is your you know board, that means what kind of flavor of Teensy? Here's like all these flavors of Teensy. I'm sorry, of Arduino. There's so many. And there's a bunch of flavors of Teensy, and there's even more with the boards manager. There's like a million kinds of Arduino. There's a huge community. There's all this code. There's all this hardware. It's amazing. And you pick USB type. So Paul has made it possible to like have your device be a MIDI device, or four vir virtual MIDI devices, or a serial device and a MIDI device like together on the same USB connection, or a keyboard, or a mouse, or a joystick, you know, like a gaming controller, um, all kinds of interesting things. So anyways, I'm all about... Arduino, and I'm all about uh, Teensy these days. It's made it really um, easy for me to, uh, to produce a lot of the cool stuff I do, um, uh, specifically the hardware that needs to do some like embedded MIDI or audio kind of stuff. <clears throat> so yeah, um, what else, what else? So in this world of Teensy, that's a good segue, um, I did a whole live stream recently um, on circuit board artwork where I showed uh, some of my circuit board artworks. I only have one right next to me. The light there in the CD is not around. Um, go over to OBS, we'll give you a little full screen. Oops. Oh, wow. You can like click inside. No. We're going back to infinity land. I don't know if it's just me for a minute. Uh, circuit board artwork. So, developing, oops, turn it on. Developing things like this, either beautiful circuitry or in the case of my playable packaging things. Um, beautiful things or functional things. If you want to make circuits, you know, one way you can do it is you can take wire 
um, same kind of stuff inside of your USB cables and connect this thing and that thing. So that could be connecting uh, your Arduino to your LED. Um, in that example, we kind of like browse, uh, browsed past recently. Um, or it could be connecting a whole bunch of things. And you can do that with wires, but circuit boards basically make that a lot easier and a lot more reliable. So if you have um, a circuit you're making with a whole bunch of devices, you know, um, that all need to be connected together. Um, making printed circuit boards is the way you do that. So when things get uh, more complicated um, and or they need to get really small, that's when you want to start making circuit boards. And that used to be like <clears throat> a really obtuse kind of thing to do. Um, I started learning to do it in 2008 and I was using this like really awkward program that <laughs> I showed in that live stream. Uh, called Eagle CAD, which like only ran on PC, and um, it's really hard to acquire an affordable copy of it, and um, it was a mess. It still kind of is a mess, as, as we all learned together in that circuit board uh, artwork um, live stream from oh, last week. I think it was last week. No, the week before last week, uh, with special guest Alex Coyle. That was super fun. Anyway, check that out. But if you want to make stuff like this. But also, I'll make like simple functional circuits. <clears throat> so, for example, this is a little breakout board for a project, and basically, I needed to connect a bunch of sensors. Get back in the eagle. I need to connect a bunch of sensors to my uh, Teensy. And so you can see, this is the circuit board design. I have a physical one of these somewhere, but. You just check this one out. So uh, you can see there's a whole bunch of pins in this big rectangle, and that's where you'd stick a teensy in there. And then you can see on the left side, there's a whole bunch of these little four pin things. And those are basically holes to connect um, connectors. So I just found these connectors that I liked and uh, the flavor of teensy that I liked, and added some connections for these important things, like to go to USB jacks and other things. But there's all these little internal connections, and that's what all these wires are, these red and blue things. And there's enough of those that, like, if I had to do all those by hand, um, and there was actually two of these things, long story, but um, I had to use two teensies to, to use these sensors at the speed and quality that I wanted to. Um, yeah, these, uh, there's there's just so many of these connections, you know, like, it's it's faster to actually, like, even a simple circuit board like this, this is very comparatively simple circuit board uh, it's faster to like make this drawing and like order up the circuit boards and get them sent to me uh, than to try and like wire the whole thing by hand mostly because like when you're doing that many connections like inevitably there's going to be a mistake somewhere and you have to troubleshoot it and it gets really messy so anyways eagle is it's on that level of, like learning c++ i don't recommend it if you're not really serious about um, circuit design but I just want to show you one other view uh, here in Eagle, which is the schematic view. Am I in schematic? Yeah. Um, and this is where, this is kind of like a road map. So whereas this is the physical layout, and this is like where things actually physically go on a circuit board, this is <clears throat> kind of like a, a flow diagram of how those things are electrically connected. So this big crazy looking thing in the, in the center is uh, teensy and thankfully I didn't have to like set that up like people have already kind of made these you know um, components for you and so you don't have to you know make this whole giant list of inputs and output pins on this thing and you don't even have to make this footprint here where you know it draws like all the little physical pins you can kind of drop these things in if you know what you're doing and copy and paste things these connectors all around here are copy and pasted so these are the kind of two things you do in Eagle is you make a schematic and this is where you like draw your electrical connections instead of soldering them physically and this is where you kind of like lay out your parts in physical space and then you can order up these circuit boards and it's great you can make really cool stuff um, I will say no more about Eagle because we really did a whole bunch of stuff it, it was less this functional stuff like <clears throat> we didn't talk about schematic view um, in the circuit board artwork live stream we just talked about the the uh, board layout view um, but uh, yeah, check out that stream if you want to learn more about Eagle. So I said I was going to get less technical <laughs> at some point, but there is kind of a logical progression to all these things. 
So Eagle uh, was bought by this company, Autodesk, um, who's, it's good to know who owns your tools, I'll just say that, like, it really has an effect on the things, you know, you should really know your, uh, you know, I don't know, I'm using Facebook for this live stream at the moment, um, using this open source broadcasting software, OBS, which is pretty cool, um, but uh, why am I saying this? It's good to keep tabs on like who owns your software and like what the company's doing because sometimes like a company will get bought by another company and then their whole value system changes or uh, a company will buy another company just to shut it down because they're competing with them or something like that. So um, yeah, um, Autodesk is trying to have like like a monopoly on this whole ecosystem of these kind of like makery, hacky, hacky makey. Uh, kind of tools, the kind of stuff like I've been getting into so that I can make hardware to go along with my musical creations. Um, and they're trying to make a whole ecosystem. So they bought EagleCat because they're just like super popular circuit board layout software. Um, and they made it integrate really well with their 3D design uh, software. Uh, product design software, it's kind of hard to know what to call these things. But I'll share my desktop again and I will show you Fusion 360. So Eagle is now an Autodesk product. I was telling you it used to be like super clunky and now it's just like pretty clunky. <laughs> but what's one thing that's cool is it integrates with this um, 3D, uh, I have to call it, I don't know, 3D design software. I'm not really sure what to call it. Um, called Fusion 360. And this is running a little bit sluggish. I'm going to put some apps. I'm going to put Ableton. Uh, I'm going to quit uh, put Max. We'll miss you, Max. And uh, we'll put TNC because we're not using TNC. Okay. Um, right. So Fusion uh, is this. This is like a really simple thing. A buddy of mine broke this expensive scanner thing that he has. And uh, one, it's just a button kind of. It's a poorly designed button. So I designed a new button. And it's just three parts. You can see here, kind of color coded. Um, so this is a pretty simple example of the kind of stuff I do in Fusion, um, but Fusion is really great. You, um, I'll just, just do like a quick little, like my first look at Fusion. This is a totally empty Fusion document, and this is a higher level thing. This like definitely takes some tutorials. I dedicated like part of a, of a whole residency to learning this, this tool. Um, so I'll just say, you know, it took me several weeks to really feel like I had a handle on this thing. Um, anyways, I'll stop clicking without telling you what I'm doing. <laughs> Here's an empty, brand new document. Um, everything is 3D, actually kind of usually begins with 2D sketches. So you make like a sketch, you have to put a sketch on a, a surface. You start with these kind of three planes, X, Y, and Z. So let's uh, make a sketch here on this plane. And um, this is just like drawing. So this is not difficult if you use something like uh, Illustrator or... Um, uh, Affinity Designer, which we'll be showing a little bit later. Draw some lines. Um, so you can just, you know, draw whatever you want. You can measure up, like I measured up the place where that button had to go. And, um, um, and I started with those measurements when I started drawing here. So, and you can do all these things like, oh, let's make this thing a continuation of that thing. I need to make it kind of connect to this thing. It's like a super crazy advanced um, tool. So now we have a two-dimensional drawing and then we can start to make it 3D. Like let's say, let's take these things and we'll use the extrude. Um, I don't even know what my <laughs> commands are. I just know the shortcuts. E for extrude. Um, it's in there somewhere. Um, uh, yeah, and I can make this how big one of this 50 millimeters, sure. 50 millimeters, and now we've got a thing. And now we can make more sketches on this thing. Like, let's say, oh, we want to make a hole here. So um, we'll just create a sketch there, and we'll make a circle here. Great. Thank you. And where's, you can always right click and get all the things you can do. There's extrude. I don't know. I always just hit E these days, so I don't even know what I'm doing. Uh, oops, dimension tool. Whoa, and I wish I could show you some of the crazy things I built in this, but, oh, I got out of my sketch somehow. Um, but uh, most of them are still under NDA right now because they haven't been released. So yeah, you can use extrude to like make a new cylinder or 
boom, like cut a hole through this thing. And now I got a hole in our thing. So this is how you can begin to make more complex models like this. It's actually really easy and really forgiving. There's just a few abstract concepts to how it works. And you gotta like get around those, <clears throat> those concepts. Uh, and it's mostly because there's a whole history. If you look at the bottom, there's like a history of like everything I did in this project. This is an old project where they just opened up. Um, but you can see all the actions I did. So I could go back in time to like, uh, let's see, when I extruded these things and I could like edit this feature and extrude them further and say, okay. And then it redoes all the things I had done forward in time past that point, like these cool uh, uh, curves, bevels, I believe they're called. I don't know what are they called. I'm going to tell you the right name. Do modify uh, fillets. Those are fillets. Sorry not to be confused with chamfer. Um, you can tell, like, I know all these tools, like, just enough so that I can use them and, and do the useful things I need, but um, I'm, I'm an expert in none of them, I have to say. Just, just good enough to make the things I want to make. So anyways, I can, and then you can undo that, right? So uh, it's cool. You can, like, kind of go back in time. So that's one of the more difficult concepts about working with Fusion 360. Um, and this integrates with Eagle. So um, there's this whole Fusion think, Sync thing. And I'm not going to do it because it's a little tweaky, but you can like send that circuit board into Fusion and then connect your circuit board physically to these three dimensional things you're designing around it. You know, make your enclosure for your thing, your box around your electronics um, fit really well. And you can export files out of here and you can 3D print them. That's what I did with this. And there's a 3D print of this thing sitting in my workshop right now. Uh, or you can. Um, uh, send them to your metal shop. You can say like cut this thing out of metal and uh, Yeah, and these great machines like laser cutters, CNC routers, plasma cutters, water jet um, 3d printers, there's all kinds of flavors of 3d printers different methods different materials and this is all the stuff I've been getting deeper into in the last um, five or six years as I learned to make more and more slick and um, complex instruments so, yeah, that's Fusion. It's one of the, I really like Fusion because I learned like Google SketchUp and it was kind of tweaky and it didn't translate well to like 3D printing and laser cutting and that kind of stuff. And then I started learning um, SolidWorks, which is like a super professional 3D like product design tool. Um, and it's really powerful, but it was just harder to like wrap my head around and I'm not sure the tutorials I was looking at were as good, so I may have been part of the process, but uh, part of the problem. Um, but yeah, there's a whole bunch of these things. Rhino, these are things my friends and mentors use. But Fusion 360 was like really easy compared to those things. I mean, not as easy as some tools I use, but yeah, all things considered, it was pretty, pretty forgiving. Um, it's all quiet in the chat. I think, I don't know if anybody's here. I don't know anything about streaming to be honest guys to be totally honest I'm just I'm just sharing good things with you and and uh, being innovative and I'm not <laughs> trying to be innovative I'm not spending a whole lot of time on any of it mostly because I've got all these other projects to keep up in the air and try and you know keep my whole my whole world afloat in this time of crisis as a freelancer it's a challenging moment um, so yeah, I hope you're getting some out of these streams. These are all going up on uh, YouTube currently. So I watch them, find out how embarrassing they are, and then I take them down. So you can watch all the streams there. Uh, where am I now? I'm almost done showing you all the cool tools I wanted to today. Oh, I have my like my audio interface thing here. Don't be confused by that. RME makes great audio interfaces. Support RME. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show you these two other things. Affinity Photo, and really Affinity Designer. Affinity Photo, less less so. Um, but yeah, I'm excited about these largely because like I've used Adobe products in the past, like, uh, Adobe applications, like, uh, Illustrator. This is, this is very, very similar to Illustrator and there's other apps out there. I did a, a bunch of research about, oh, when was it? I don't know, three months ago, five, no, six months ago. I can't remember when, um, cause I was just getting fed up with using Illustrator and Adobe's kind of product model, creative cloud, you know, and it's great. They make everything. They're kind of doing what Autodesk is doing and making a whole uh, giant ecosystem um, 
you know, in their case, it's all like desktop publishing stuff. But um, anyways, uh, I wasn't feeling Adobe's flow. So I explored what else is out there. And Affinity is a comparatively new company. Uh, they don't have a whole ecosystem. They've got Designer, which is a vector drawing program. Vector drawing uh, means you're drawing shapes like triangles and circles, and it's all mathematical based. So, you know, I can zoom in as far as I want on this curvy thing, and it still looks like a nice smooth curve. Um, that's what vector based <clears throat> artwork is. Um, it's, it's all mathematical based, and uh, that's contra contrasted with uh, bitmap or raster based images. Um, check my terminology. Um, but these are essentially, um, yeah, bitmaps. They're better for storing, creating photos or videos. A frame of video is a bitmap. And these, you can see when you zoom in, you see those individual pixels. Um, so yeah, pixel, uh, bitmap, or um, uh, yeah, photo editing. I don't know. Those are all terms associated with uh, um, applications like Affinity Photo, which aims to do a lot of what Photoshop does. What else does Affinity make? I want to actually refresh myself because I'm, I'm really digging their stuff. Affinity, I don't know how to spell Affinity, two apps. I think we're all forgetting how to spell now that we have like auto correct and correction. Um, there's other companies. Serif, yeah, that's it. Other Affinity companies. Bad trademark guys. Uh, photo designer, that's what I have. Uh, publisher, yeah, so they only have three products so far. Uh, and yeah, publisher is like the, the layout. Um, what's Adobe's version of it? It's like, is it InDesign or? No, I can't remember. Um, but yeah, it's the one, this is the one for like, you know, you're making magazines and menus and multi page uh, kind of things. And you want to look slick. So anyways, I haven't used that one. I'm not trying to be a commercial for Affinity or anything. Uh, I'm just psyched about my two new toys. Um, anyways, um, yeah, 2D vector drawing tool. Like, these are cool when you want to do something like this. Like, this is, uh, I can't tell you what this is for, but this is not an actual drawing of the mojo. I just, like, traced this. You know, I brought in a photo of the mojo. So this is a photo, professional photo and um, just use that to quickly trace uh, these vector objects, you know, circles and squares. Let's get in here and start moving some of these around. Um, and I was just trying to create this like simplified like line art version of the mojo that you could see easily like from far away, right? Like when you get far away from something like uh, a photo, Oops. Um, you kind of lose yeah, it's got all that complexity of screw holes and shadows and all that stuff, and I just wanted this very simple version of it. So this is a good example of what Affinity Designer is good for. And it it's a little bit tweaky, like, I have to say, if you're just getting into vector drawing, you know, there's always ways to approach it. There's, like, from shapes, so you can draw shapes and move them and rotate them and take uh, multiple shapes and give them different colors and fill them in with gradients. I love this gradient tool actually. This is one of the things I was like, oh, that's such a better way to do gradients. Um, anyway, the gradient is like a fade from one color to another. Who doesn't like fading colors? Um, and then you can, I don't know what this is exactly, but you can like combine shapes together. You know, so that's one approach. Or you can grab something like a pencil and like start drawing something like this. And I don't know what this is exactly. Um, but yeah, you can see you wind up with these little breakpoints. Um, it's called a path. I'll get into terminology. I'll probably just lose myself. But yeah, you can adjust paths. Uh, all these things, you know, you can make them look all different kinds of ways and connect them together and group them. And anyways, it's a very fun... A uh, way not to make not only to make you know graphical art, but you can make very um, kind of technically specific things. So this is where I'll come if I need to make like I don't know a graphic to go on something, uh, for example. Like uh, you know it's got to be a certain specific size, but I want to make something graphically very interesting. And so I'll come in here, um, 
for like artwork, you know, that's going to go on Facebook or Bandcamp or something. It's got specific dimensions, you know, so you're bringing in a photo or something and you want to, yeah, I don't know, you get the idea. <laughs> Anyways, uh, designer is great for creating original artworks and um, photo is great for, you know, editing your bitmaps. So <laughs> I won't get into what project this is for. But um, yeah, it's basically like all the things you can do in Photoshop. Um, I will say both of these are a little bit um, uh, lighter versions of of what they're kind of emulating. So they're not um, they're not as powerful and developed as Photoshop. Um, so if you're super super deep into Photoshop and you know all your keyboard shortcuts and stuff, you can actually customize all the keyboard shortcuts in here, which is pretty cool. Um, then this may not be the tool for you. But if you're someone like me who never got super deep into Photoshop and is like really interested to see like, oh, like how could maybe a rethinking of the interface uh, for something like this, like make my life easier um, and make it a $50 one-time purchase instead of a subscription, which is just what I wanted. Um, then yeah, maybe this is for you. Oh look, I just discovered a new feature. I did that by accident the other day and I couldn't figure out why. This tab, it makes all the toolbars go away, so you can just like look at the art and use the tool. That's super slick. See, even I learned something today. This is great. Live streams for the win. Hey, what's up, Pat? I didn't see you come in. I didn't see you come in either, Jason. Welcome. Um, what uh, what can I do for you guys? That's the whole. That's the whole workshop uh, live stream edutainment thing I had planned. So. Well, I can review. Um, we closed some of the apps, but we went over uh, Ableton, Max, um, Arduino, the Arduino IDE, uh, Eagle CAD, the circuit board design software, um, Fusion 360. Um, I didn't talk about OBS. I don't really know what I'm doing with OBS, to be honest. It's just like a little live mixer of a video and audio. Um, and it's free. It's a great live streaming tool. I was able to learn it, get it up and running in like 30 minutes. So I'll recommend that. Um, but yeah, those are all the tools I make. I used to make, you know, these kind of physical things, mostly, obviously, like uh, Affinity Designer and Photo. I'm using to make, you know, graphics and edit photos and stuff, which aren't a physical thing, but they definitely inter interweave with these other um, softwares that I'm using to make controllers and jam boxes and uh, playable packaging and all this crazy stuff. So, yeah, if you have any questions, I'd love to hear them. Um, we'll probably confine this to an hour. And I see questions. Yeah, Pat, uh, I was wondering if you use good old Excel in your product. Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad you mentioned that. It's actually on my list. Um, you're still seeing. I should switch. I'm not really talking about software. Let's go back here. There's my list, and I forgot. Um, Excel. I used to use Excel, but I'm going, going deeper into Apple. I'm not using much Microsoft. But yeah, I use um, Apple Numbers, which is essentially Excel, to do a lot of stuff. Thank you for reminding me of that. I was probably showing you, Pat and I did a tour, um, a road tour a few years ago. That was crazy times. And um, I probably showed you my tour spreadsheet. <laughs> um, I organize a lot of things in numbers. Um, I won't show it to you because it's like people's personal info, but um, I'll throw it open real quick. So it's everything from just like a list of people who I'm inviting to my online movie night on Saturday to like all my contacts, like my booking database for when I put together a tour. Um, so like organizing contacts and then also like organizing a tour where you've got like all this information about all these dates and they're moving around and um, spreadsheets are really useful for that. I use it um, specifically in this context I was going to mention I use it for like like all the parts for a project, you know, like something like, um, let's talk about the voice crusher, for example. You know, there's there's some like 40 different components on here. It's a lot to keep track of, you know, and so having all the data about all of them in a spreadsheet is like pretty critical. Um, even for something not as complicated as this, like I'll use a spreadsheet just to keep it all organized. Because as you can imagine, when you're using all these different applications, like things get crazy. And so you got to be good at file management. Um, and Excel is, is like not file management, but it's information management. Super, super helpful. Thank you for that question, Pat. Um, miss you, brother. Um, do I use the Arduino IDE exclusively or link it to something like Visual Studio Code? Good question. Um, 
like I said, I'm I'm tr I'm getting more serious about uh, learning C++. Just got to get back to it. I'm gonna make a note for myself. Start doing those tutorials again. Um, uh, yeah, the Arduino IDE. Uh, that's this application I showed you. Um, it's really just like a text editor, right? It does some like highlighting of of different things in different colors to like make it easier to to read the code and to write the code. Um, but there's much better IDE. What is IDE again? Somebody tell me. It's like <laughs> it, I could I could look it up for you. Yeah, it's, I'm not as one day I'll have one of those like people just sitting there, a producer, just like typing things into Google for me. Um, and telling me what things mean, making me sound smarter. Uh, IDE means a lot of things. <laughs> Peptides, integrated development environment. All right, cool. So you can tell I'm not I'm not a coder. Um, yeah, uh, Visual Studio. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I have that installed, and I'm just getting hip to it. Visual Visual Studio Code, um, running natively on on Apple's OS, Mac OS. And it's a lot better. That's the one I tried a few actually, and Visual Studio is the one that wound up in my application doc. So I think Visual Studio is a pretty good one. It was recommended by my friend and conspirator, Turner Kirk, aka Efficiency Junkie. Uh, he turned me on to that. So that's going to make my code learning a lot more efficient. The only thing is, like, it's hard to set that stuff up. So actually, I've been using also an online, um, there's like in your browser IDEs that are not great for like serious programming for sure, but you don't have to do all this setup stuff. And I won't talk about the setup stuff, but yeah, maybe it's because I'm running on Apple. It's like, oh, you gotta install Xcode, and Apple's Xcode package is like a six gigabyte download. And like, I just don't wanna install a six gigabyte thing when I'm just like a C++ beginner. Thank you, Jason, you ordered my, answered my question more quickly than I did. <laughs> Um, a lot of data, spreadsheet master. Thank you, you're too kind, Pat. Appreciate that. Um, VS, Visual VSC, Visual Studio Code in place of Arduino, and it's great. Okay, so there's another thumbs up for uh, Visual Studio Code. So maybe I will, uh, I'm, uh, I'm hoping to get a new laptop with more storage in the near future. Maybe that's when I'll just be like, six gigabytes, whatever, bring it on. I've also got the bandwidth now. I fixed my uh, my internet connection. We were having some issues on Tuesday, and uh, I was a little sad because I had a guest and it was all glitching. I don't know why. It's so frustrating when you're like, you know, if something totally breaks, you're like, okay, it's broken, it's dead, the stream is over. <clears throat> when it's partially broken, you don't know why. It's the most frustrating thing ever. So, anyways, I'm glad my bandwidth is back up to my standards, and. Um, these live streams are kicking again. So yeah, um, I've been chatting for an hour, 52 minutes and some change. Um, if you got any more questions, I can continue to answer them in the comments. So you want to keep these things relatively brief. Um, I wonder where these things will land, you know? Will we look back on these live stream archives and two years from now when this crisis is all over and be like, man, what the heck were we thinking? <laughs> Will we all be living underground in some post-apocalyptic future where we're fighting each other for water and uh, gasoline and, you know, and, and, uh, and we won't even be able to play these videos anymore. Technology is all the lost. I don't know. I'm not trying to be too defeatist. I am also here to offer some words of encouragement. Mm, it's been a little bit of a challenging week for me, um, but I should say... <clears throat> I am really fortunate. Look at me. I'm in a studio. I got a private space where I can be creative and I can work. And, um, you know, it does seem like the world's falling apart. I am not doing gigs I would normally be doing. I have no security <laughs> in all the, you know, financial ends in my world. Um, uh, I know a lot of people are, like, losing jobs. They're losing relatives. I'm, I'm laughing because it's so weird to go from one moment, you know, where a friend of mine is like, oh, my, my friend passed away my my dad's got COVID-19 to the next minute you know where you're just sitting at home like with yourself all day trying to like make the best of it be productive like help your community you know be of service in a time where a lot of us are kind of crippled and how we can normally serve people so don't mean to pivot from you all this uh, fine 
wonderful technology, geeky makery, hacky stuff. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to share that I'm I'm grateful for the relative um, peace and security and stability in my life. And I hope you all um, remember that that situation does not exist for a lot of people. Um, and I hope you take time to do something. Whether it's live streams like these, or um, donating money to those in need, or offering other services and goods to those in need, or reaching out to those, you know, in emotional strife, offering support because, you know, they're suffering um, physically or emotionally, all those things. Um, yeah, surreal time, indeed. Um, so I think I'll wrap it up there. Further technical questions, I'll definitely be in the chat. Thank you all for tuning in. Uh, I'm really glad to know uh, a little bit more about what works and what doesn't work in this world. I got more live streams coming up. Um, check out my Facebook artist page. Search for Moldover. And uh, hopefully you can find it. It's called Moldover Matter. It's a whole series of live streams. I'm coming at you with two more next week. Um, I may not be on social media very much. I haven't been on it lately. I've just been like doing my creative thing, and that feels pretty good. Um, yeah, and I won't say much more, but um, moderation. Moderate social media. Moderate the news. That's stuff that helps keep me sane. sane. So I hope you're sane, too. And uh, thanks for tuning in.